Are you on? Okay, good morning. Uh, I've got a couple of things to talk to you about today. So you're going to, this is a day that you'll be glad you came, glad you did. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let's not forsake assembling ourselves together. I'm so glad you're here. I've got, I'm going to announce the holy days real quickly here. Uh, now, trumpets is the only one of the seven annual holy days on the biblical calendar that we really cannot predict in advance when it comes we just don't know and remember we don't know the day and the hour that Jesus is returning either so we know when Pentecost is weeks in advance we, we can know when Passover is a couple of weeks in advance but we don't know when trumpets is until the new moon is seen and so uh, we've got computer programs now that are 90 some percent accurate but that doesn't predict the weather the way they did it in Jesus' day, if it was cloudy, they didn't see the new moon. They they automatically, if it was at the end of the 29th, they automatically waited to the next day. That's why Noah has five months in a row there, 30 days, because after the flood, it was cloudy. He couldn't see the moon for five months. And so the Jews realized, well, that's what we're supposed to do then. We, if, if the 29th day is cloudy, you automatically have the 30th day, which means you could be one day off. But then since God ordained it that way, and that's how Jesus observed it, in the first century, then that was perfectly okay. Jesus never criticized that or, or condemned it. So, uh, but usually in in uh, March and April and, uh, and at this time of the year in Israel, it's usually clear, and so it's not going to be a hard thing for them to see the new moon. Now, for those of you who are, are newer than others, the new moon starts the month. When you see the little baby crescent, little tiny crescent in the west just after sundown, if it's, for example, Every Jew in Israel knows if they see the new moon right after sundown on Friday night, Friday's not the first day of the month. Saturday would be the first day of the month. And so that's where it's going to be this, this year. Uh, Friday evening at sundown on September the 18th, go out in your backyard at, sun, at sunset and see if you see the new cre the little new crescent. But it still has to be seen in Israel. Uh, and Because that's where it's proclaimed from. Micah 4, the law goes forth from Zion, which is Jerusalem. So when they see the new crescent moon on Friday evening at sundown, that means that the, the, that the uh, we start the seventh month the next day. Now, you might say, that's kind of complicated. Well, it's not really complicated. There's something beautiful about that because Jesus said, no man knows the day and the hour until you see him in the clouds. Until you actually go outside and you see Jesus coming back in the clouds of heaven, you don't gonna, you're not going to know the day and the hour. And so until we actually see the moon on Friday evening or Saturday evening, we will not know 100% when trumpets is. Isn't that amazing? But all the other holy days, we know when they are. Because if trumpets falls on, a, on the 19th and all the rest of them, all, we automatically know when they're going to be. We know when Pentecost is, et cetera, et cetera. So this day pictures the second coming of Christ when nobody knows. Isn't that amazing? And uh, so anyway. Um, the 19th is a Saturday, the 28th is a Monday, and, and uh, God said, observe the holy days, and, and he ordained these days forever, and he didn't give them to the Jews only. Exodus 12, 49 says, the same law I'm giving Israel is for the stranger, the sojourners among you. We're the strangers to the old covenant, we're Gentiles, it's for us also. And so, atonement is on the 28th, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, and the last great day, those holy days also fall on Saturdays. Any questions on that? Well, I won't turn there for time's sake, but Colossians 2.17 says the holy days are shadows of things to come. What was Passover a shadow of? Or at least the Passover day, the preparation day, when they killed the lamb. It was, yeah, they killed a, a physical sheep a lamb and John the Baptist said behold the lamb of God talking about Jesus and he died on that very day so Passover was a shadow of the crucifixion what was now Pentecost is when the law was given at Mount Sinai in Moses day but what also was that a shadow of yeah the first fruits it's called the day of first fruits in Numbers 28 and that's when the Holy Spirit came the next holy day after Pentecost is trumpets what is that a shadow of well let me ask you this what has the church been looking forward to for the last 2,000 years second coming of Christ and when Christ returns he's going to get rid of the devil for a thousand years and finally the world can be reconciled the Greek word atonement can be translated reconciled so we have a day of reconciliation a day of atonement 
And that's when the whole world is going to be fasting and repenting before God. And God says, now I want you to do that. Remember this. These are shadows of things to come. Uh, five days later is the first day of a, of a week-long feast, which if we had enough people to do it, we could have a big camp out and have a great big revival and invite everybody in Kannapolis to come. And they'd enjoy it. But uh, we are going to keep just the holy days. The, the first day of the seven-day festival is a holy day, and that's going to be on October the 3rd, a Saturday. And so we'll have a service here. We'll go through the meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. That picture is as any commentary, as any reference Bible, like my Schofield reference Bible will tell you, it, and, and, and as theologians will tell you, it pictures the thousand-year reign of Christ. But they don't know what the last day pictures. There's a holy day that follows the Feast of Tabernacles, and that pictures something very, very good that happens after the thousand years, which I'll wait till then to tell you about it. <clears throat> so if you're taking notes, also Hebrews 10.1 says there's shadows of good things to come. Isaiah 46.10 says God declares the end from the beginning. So these holy days declare how things are going to end up. Leviticus 23, verse 2, God said, these are my feasts. They're not Jews. Now, Hanukkah, that's Jewish. I don't celebrate it. It's a national day for Jewish people. I'm not, I'm not a Jew, so I don't, I've don't. i never celebrated Hanukkah. Don't ask me how to do it or when it comes. You have to ask a Jew that. I don't know. Um, Purim, I know that's sometime in March, I think. But, but I don't, all I know is what I read in the book of Esther. But God didn't give that, and that's fine for them to do. We have July 4th. Somebody asked the question, do the British have July 4th in England? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on their calendar, July 4th. Comes after the 3rd. When, when I was a, uh, a student in college in, in East Texas, we had a, quite a number of people from England to come over. And of course, the campus took off July 4th as a big holiday. And I went up to some of the British students and said, you going to be celebrating July 4th with us? <laughs> I'm going to sit in my dorm. <laughs> they didn't like that at all. They remember that day just for a whole different reason. Oh, yeah. No, not one of them would celebrate it with us. Happy Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> so, but see, July 4th is an American holiday, and there's nothing wrong with it. Thanksgiving, the last Thursday of November, is an American holiday. Enjoy it. Fine. But they're not. But those days are not God's days. Only those seven holy days in Leviticus 23 are God's days. So anyway, that's a little bit of information on that. In fact, um, I did write down a few scriptures about this. And I'm going to turn to Ezekiel 40. Now, it, the, the reason I recommend the Schofield, there's an excellent outline. Not all the notes you would agree with, but there's an excellent outline. And so what Schofield does, he outlines every one of these, these, these books in the Bible. And when you get to chapter 40 of Ezekiel, it says part seven, well, above verse above chapter 37, it says part six. When you get to chapter 40, it says part seven. And then it tells you what this is. From chapters 40 through the end of the book, general theme, Israel in the land during the kingdom age, during the thousand years. If you've got a Schofield, you see that. Or other Bibles that, that outline it, you probably see that. Okay, now, here's what it says. And so all those last nine chapters deal with the millennium. In chapter 43 and verse 20, uh, Verse 2 it says, in this during the millennium, Behold the glory of, of the God of Israel came, now the God of Israel is Jesus Christ, from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. That's not the first coming, folks. That's the second coming. And verse 7, Jesus tells Ezekiel, Son of man, the place of my throne, pointing to it, and the place of the soles of my feet. Here's where I will dwell with the midst of, in the midst of the children of Israel. How long? Forever. Ezekiel 43, verse 7. Yeah, I'm going to dwell with the children of Israel forever. In chapter 44 and verse 20, neither, <clears throat> here he's talking about the priest. They're going to be offering sacrifices for a thousand years. Neither shall they shave their heads so they won't be bald, nor suffer their locks to grow long, like you see in these pictures that's supposed to be the Messiah with the shoulder length there. It's not going to be. They shall only pull their heads. Pull means to cut or to trim. So they'll get haircuts. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court, etc. But what else also will they do for the thousand years? Verse 23, they'll teach my people to discern between the unclean and the clean. So people won't eat in skunks and rats and dogs and cats like they do it. Like in China, they put rats on a, on a 
the stick and call it shish kebab. They're eating mice. Uh, verse 24, the last line, they shall hallow my Sabbaths, plural, and so on. So this is all during the millennium. Um, let's see, verse 40, chapter 45, verse 21, and the first month and the 14th day, you shall have, whether you want to have it or not, you shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. The whole world will be celebrating the Passover uh, for, for a period of seven days. And then, uh, let's see, that's 45. Look, chapter 46, verse 13 says, what's that? I said you missed 25, verse 25. Verse 25. Oh, in the seventh month, thank you, in the 15th day of the month, shall he do in the like of the Feast of the Seven Days. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> chapter 46, verse 1. <clears throat> the temple will be closed the six working days. What are the six working days? Sunday through Friday, but on the Sabbath it shall be open. Verse 3, likewise the people of the land shall worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbaths, plural, and in the new moons. The only new moon that's a holy day is the Feast of, of Trumpets. So this is going to be during the millennium. Now the reason the average Protestant doesn't know this is because they think that when they die, they go to heaven, they stay in heaven forever. They're missing out on the entire thousand year millennium reign of Christ. If you go to heaven and you live forever in heaven, wait a minute, you're going to miss Jesus. Jesus just told Ezekiel, here's the place of my throne where I will dwell with them forever. So if, in fact, there's one book uh, called Things to Come by a, a man who was considered a very reputable scholar. His name was Dwight Pentecost. And he said that some people go to heaven forever and some stay on the earth forever. Hmm. Now, I know for a fact that the, Jesus is going to come here and stay forever. So for all those of you who are going to heaven forever, <coughs> bless your hearts. Because <coughs> you won't get to be with Jesus, but I will because I'm going to stay here. I am not going to heaven. I'm going to stay here where Jesus is. So if you want to, Jesus said, where I am, there you may be also. Oh, except for those of you who are going to heaven. But is it, is it the kingdom of heaven? It's the kingdom of heaven. Right. But people don't want to be in the kingdom of heaven, which is going to be here on this earth. They want to go to the third heaven up there. Well, right now, that's where Jesus is. But when he comes back here, he says, where I am, there you may be also. Where is he going to be when he comes back? He won't be in the third heaven. He'll be here on the earth. And he just told Ezekiel he'll be right over there in Jerusalem. Now, he might visit Kannapolis. <laughs> but we're going to be with him, so we're going to be living with him also over there. Let's see a few more, just a couple more scriptures, then I'll get into my main message. David, I did want to share uh, these things with you. Kind of a two-part message today, all in one, one sermon today. Um, let's see, uh, 46, let me look at uh, verse 17. This is also going to be happening during the thousand years. Look at the third line, the year of liberty. Your margin will tell you, mine says Leviticus 25, that's the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, all debts, public and private, will be canceled. Every 50 years, a big Jubilee celebration. Now, the Jews have had a legend, I don't know how many centuries, maybe for a few thousand years. The Jews have a legend that the, the Messiah will set up his kingdom in a jubilee year. E.W. Bullinger, I think, but I know that um, uh, the guy who wrote Jesus, uh, the Messiah, uh, he, what's his name? Edersheim. Edersheim. Y'all study, some of y'all study, did y'all study Edersheim in doctoral class? Alfred Edersheim. He was Jewish, he grew up Jewish, and then he got converted to Christianity. And he explains how that the Messiah is supposed to come in a Jubilee year. He also believes, and other scholars believe, that when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he came in a Jubilee year. He either started his ministry in a Jubilee year, or he died in a Jubilee year. Since that time, there have been 39 Jubilees. And 40 is a very significant number, so it's very possible that Christ may come back at the next Jubilee. And if that happens, we're looking at somewhere around the next, you know, 8 to 11 years, something like that. I am not setting dates. Big announcement. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. He hasn't told me. But if he does come back in our lifetime, that's probably when he would come back at the time of the Jubilee. And on top of that, they've made an announcement in Israel that they're now ready to build it. So it won't be very long. And then <clears throat> chapter 48, the last verse says, 
the second line, the name of the city of Jerusalem from that day shall be the Lord is there. Not that they're going to change the name of Jerusalem to some word that means that, but it's just like when I say Washington, D.C., oh, the president is there. When I say Hollywood, oh, that's where they make movies. When I say Jerusalem during that thousand years, oh, that's where the Lord lives. He won't be in Kannapolis. He won't be in Charlotte. He won't be in South Dakota or Canada. Or for those of you who are watching different places around the world, he's going to be in Jerusalem. So any questions on, on that? All right. That's just a little uh, introduction. I'm not actually going to preach on it today, but those are the holy days plan to be here with us. The only day you have to take off from work would be the 28th. That's a Monday. And we'll have our service here every day at 1030 for these services. And then at that time, I'll explain the meaning of these holy days. You might say, well, you did that last year. Yeah, but God wants us to do it every year and every year and every year and every year to keep this in our minds to, so you don't forget it. They say what you don't use, you lose. If we don't constantly use these scriptures and go over them, over them, five years from now, you'll say, what did he say trumpets was? I don't remember now. I went to college, but I can't remember what trumpets represent. See, if you don't do it year after year after year, you can forget it. You might, you might forget it. And you don't want to do that. Watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Okay, now, enough for that. Now I've got a little announcement here. People are wondering about this vaccine business. Uh, and this came off the internet just uh, yesterday. That's when I was able to print it off. <clears throat> but it actually came out. CNN actually brought this out on uh, what's today, the 5th? So this was five days ago when this came out by CNN. Vaccine experts are warning the federal government against rushing out a coronavirus vaccine before testing has shown it's both safe and effective. It may not be safe. For those of you who are planning to be the first one in line to get a shot, you might want to think about this. Decades of history show why they're right. On, on April the 12th, 1955, the government announced the first vaccine to protect kids against polio. How wonderful, isn't that great? Within days, labs have been made, thousands of lots of the vaccine. Batches made by one company, Cutter Labs, accidentally contained live polio virus and it caused an outbreak. More than 200,000 children got the polio vaccine, but within days, the government had to abandon the program because between 1955 and 1963, between 10% and 30% of those vaccines were contaminated during that time, and it was transferred to millions of Americans. So we have to make sure that the vaccine is safe. So don't be the guinea pig, say, hey, you test me. Uh, I wouldn't do that. In 1976, scientists predicted a pandemic of a new strain of flu called swine flu. Y'all remember the swine flu? Who wants to get flu off of a pig? More than 40 years later, some historians call it the flu epidemic that never was. Ford, President Ford, was being cajoled to put forward a vaccine that was hastily put together. Ford made the decision to make the immunization compulsory, where everybody had to get a flu shot. The government launched the program in about seven months, and 40 million people got vaccinated against swine flu, according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. That vaccination campaign was later linked to cases of a neurological disorder called the Gilliam Barr syndrome. Vaccinations can be dangerous. Gilliam Barr, I've heard of that. I can't remember what the symptoms are. <clears throat> Last paragraph, it, it took several incidents, incidents for people to start distrusting vaccines. A too early EUA for a vaccine could cause a nightmare scenario, scenario for several uh, reasons. One, the vaccine may not be safe to start with. Number two, it, it, if it's not safe, people will lose faith in vaccines. Three, if a vaccine doesn't offer complete protection, people will have a false sense of security and therefore they'll go out and increase their risk. Number four, if a substandard vaccine gets an EUA, that would be getting an approval. A better vaccine may never get approval because people would be reluctant to enroll in trials and risk getting a placebo instead of a vaccine. And fifth, even safe vaccines are not safe. They all have side effects. So if, they, if you decide you'd like to take the vaccine, that's entirely up to you. But wait until it's been tested and tested and tested and tested and tested. Let the volunteers go test it. You'd be the last one to get it. But I, I, uh, I don't plan personally to get it. All right, I just want to share that with Dr. you. Dr. Roller posted a comment about that. Okay, what did Dr. Roller have to say? If you're first in line for the vaccine, consider yourself one of the research volunteers. 
still be doing what I did when I was working for the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease in Frederick, Maryland. That'd be a guinea pig. A guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be a guinea pig. Thank you, Dr. Roller, for that comment. I want I to. A question too. Oh, you got a question? Okay. It's a, a, no, the Jews have a legend that he would, and when you study Leviticus 25, it does make sense when you consider that Jesus said he came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, mm -hmm. and if he came the first time in a jubilee year, it's very likely that he would come. And, and, and as I said, I haven't set dates, I've never set dates, and I'm not setting dates now, but all I'm saying is, wouldn't it be interesting if he did? There's another question. All right, another question. And it might be something we can address later, Okay. But it's still about Okay. It's from our friends Al and Willow in South Carolina. A question I have for the spring next year. The first day of unleavened bread falls on the Sunday next year. When do you start to count towards Pentecost when this happens? That's an excellent question. Uh, what were their names? Al and Willow. I don't know their last name. Okay. Al. All right. Uh, the question is if the first day of, of the Passover feast, the feast, first day of unleavened bread, falls on a Sunday, when do you start to count the Pentecost? There have been churches that waited until uh, the Sunday outside of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and started from that day and counted forward. But when you study Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1, you'll see that they started counting with the Sunday during Passover week. So even though that's the wave sheet, Sunday's the wave sheet, that's day number one of your 50 days to Pentecost, even if, even if it falls on an annual Sabbath, that's still the wave sheet. And that's still the first day of the 50 days. So yes, that is the way she, not the Sunday outside of the, of the Feast of Passover. And you can read it, if you study Joshua 5 very carefully, you'll see that. All right, good questions. Um, the greatest commandment in the Bible, you had better start obeying if you want to escape the tribulation. You and I better pay close attention to the first and great commandment. Now we know what that is. If I had told you that today I'm going to talk about love, you'd say, oh, I already know about that. I'll just stay home today because I won't learn anything I didn't already know. You might. The greatest commandment, Jesus said, love God with all your heart. Now, when the great tribulation comes, and it could start in the next few years, it could. Because three and a half years after they offer the first sacrifice in Jerusalem, and they're already petitioning Benjamin Netanyahu, remember I talked to you about that, was it last week or two weeks ago, um, to let them do something, a blow the shofar, they're, all, they're getting closer and closer. When this tribulation comes, the only way you and I are going to escape the tribulation is if we truly, truly love God. Now you say, oh, I'll keep, I already love God, I love God by my heart. Well, let's see, what is God's love language? I brought a book here, Dr. Spence teaches this in graduate school. He, he did teach it on the doctoral level. Now he's, he's improving the master's class. He's going to move this from the doctoral level to the master's class, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And what, what, he, what this is about, and I won't give you a full book review, but when you get married, your spouse has a, has a special love language. It's going to fit one of those five categories. Uh, gentlemen, maybe your wife's love language is, is uh, words of affirmation, but you never say anything nice to her. Maybe your love language is physical touch, but that's not hers. So you think, well, since my love language is number three, I'm gonna give her number three out of those five love languages, but hers is you know, a different one. In fact, let me give you how they're listed here in the table of contents. I don't think that's in any particular order, but I'll just read them to you. Number one is words of affirmation. That's where you affirm the person. It can be in marriage, it can be with your children too. Number two is quality time. That happens to be my number one love language. Number three, receiving gifts. Number four, acts of service, and number five, physical touch. Somebody already put somebody to sleep back there. Who was? 
These are the five love languages that we didn't know about in marriage. In fact, we had one couple say they didn't think they'd even be still married if it hadn't been for going through this class and coming to the college in general. I want to uh, talk about these love languages in reference to God today. Jesus tells you what his main love language is. John 14, 15, what does it say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, I love God. We sing the song, oh, how I love Jesus. Well, if you love me, keep my commandments. I heard this, first time I heard this explained was some years ago by a man by the name of Gary Smalley. He's like a marriage type counseling fellow. And he said, if husbands, if your love language is, say, apples and your wife's love language is, say, tomatoes, since you love apples, you give her a whole sack of apples on her birthday and she hates apples. But that's how you express love. So since I express love with apples, I'm going to give you apples, but you don't like apples. If her love language is tomatoes, give her tomatoes, even though they make you break out. If her love language is tomatoes, give her a sack of tomatoes. She will feel loved. When it's your birthday, she needs to give you a sack of apples because that's, that makes you feel loved. You understand the principle now of the love language. Now, I dated a girl here just a few years ago, and she said, my number one love language, she'd read this book, is acts of service. The most romantic thing that a man can do is get the vacuum cleaner out and vacuum the floor and wash the dishes. That ain't my love language. <laughs> and I knew that relationship wasn't going too far. <laughs> Ah, but yeah, she told me that when I see a man with a vacuum cleaner, just, you know, I just get so excited. I just feel so romantically attracted to him. Oh, boy. So That's tomorrow morning, I'm going to get the vacuum cleaner out and vacuum. What? That's why I'm protecting the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> so you vacuum all the time because that's your wife's love language. Huh? Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Mine is quality time. I don't care how good she looks. If she never talks to me, then and I never spend quality time. I love good intellectual conversation. Let's talk about Einstein. Let's talk about trigonometry. Let's talk about, uh, can't find girls who want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Well, I wouldn't necessarily talk to a girl about Einstein. But you know, it'd be nice to have a, an intellectual conversation, quality time. Anyway. Let me go through these five love languages and show you how they apply to God. Because if we're going to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind, let's look at it. Number one I'm going to give you is quality time. Let's look at that. Quality time with God means you meditate on his word. You think about God. Take a walk at night. Go outside and look up at the stars. Many, many times I've done that just for exercise or just to relax. Had no intentions of praying. Just I want to go out and look at the stars. And when I'm out there, I'm not out there more than five minutes. I'm already talking to God about how beautiful his creation is. Quality time. Quality time is not bless this food, bless her, bless us for it, and no more amen. That's not quality time. Praying over the food, good thing, but it's not quality time. Spending time talking to God. Now, don't answer this out loud because this is none of my business, but I'm going to ask you to think about it. When's the last time you've gone to God, maybe in your prayer closet, maybe out taking a walk and just told him how much you really appreciate all he's done for you? how much you really, really genuinely love him. If all you've got is religion, I wouldn't give you a dime for it. Oh, but we keep the holy days. How sweet. You know who killed Jesus? People who kept the holy days. That's not an anti-Semitic remark. It happens to be a historical fact. Just because you tithe everything that you can get your hands on. The Pharisees tithed everything. They, remember the guy in that Luke 18, I, I give tithes of all that I possess. The Greek word there means acquire. And I'm glad I'm not like this publican over here. The publican just said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He went down, down to his house justified. If all you've got is religion, you ain't got enough. What if you married somebody who was so perfect, uh, could wash dishes better than anybody you've ever seen, could cook better than anybody you've ever seen, got several degrees in culinary skills and home economics, and and oh, and on top of that, they 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 they're a millionaire and they got all this money, but they don't want to spend any quality time with you, and they don't really love you. See, the Pharisees do not love Jesus. Do you know? I think it's chapter seven of John. Jesus said. Moses gave you the law, but none of you are keeping it. 
Why are you trying to kill me? They were trying to kill him, and he knew it. That breaks the Ten Commandments right there. There's a question. Okay, I'll take it. You don't have a field there are other ways you can apply that it's talking about gleaning don't glean the corners of your field <clears throat> uh, there are other things you can do sometimes I've deliberately when I was in college and we were all poor I deliberately leave a piece of soap for the next guy that couldn't afford to buy any <laughs> I've done that before <laughs> there have been times when I couldn't afford soap and I'd go in there hoping somebody would leave some for me <laughs> So it's the same principle. So that's how we can do that. See, that, that law is literal, but it's also a principle. You know, uh, maybe give some of your clothes to somebody that can't afford any, that type of thing. Hand-me-downs, same principle. So you don't have to have a field to obey that. It's called the Hillel principle, going from the lesser to the greater. But reading God's words, you're spending time with God. You get to know him. In Genesis 5, I won't turn there, Genesis 5, 22 and 24, twice it says Enoch walked with God. And that pleased God. To walk with God is not necessarily physically walking, although I think I walk with God when I go out at night and talk to God. He's right there with me. Jesus said, God is always with me. So spending quality time with God. You can do all the right things, keep all the right days, do all the right commandments, and still not love God. Now, you see, here's the problem. Okay, I know Jesus said love God with all your, all your heart, and this is how it's done in a lot of churches. The preacher says, now go home and love God. Yes, sir. Let's, but how do we do it? I want to talk about how to love God. One of the ways you love God with all your heart is you spend time with God. Now, that doesn't mean to go to your prayer closet and say, God bless Aunt Ethel and Uncle Fred and God bless Cousin Joe and Cousin Andy and Cousin Barney and all these people. Well, you can do that. But spending quality time with God is appreciating Him. Thank you, God, for all that you've given me. One of the ways you learn to love God with all your heart, because you can't just turn it on, but one of the ways you do that is by thinking what He's done for you. You haven't starved yet. None of you have. There are people in the world that have actually gone to bed at night malnourished and they die in their sleep from starvation. That hasn't happened to any of us yet. You know, I thank God for little things. I can I can smell smells. A lot of people, they, 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 their olfactory sense stops working after a certain period of time. I got a good sense of smell. Uh, I could say I smell good, right? Um, I can see color. I've got good hearing. Uh, maybe not as good as yours, but I've got good hearing. And I thank God for things that we take for granted. Thank you, Lord, I, I, I got a car that I drove to church today. Thank you, I've got friends. Thank you that I, I have Christian friends. Thank you for the parents who raised me. They weren't perfect, but it could have been a lot worse. And thank God for the good things. Thank God that you, if you've got brothers and sisters, man, what a blessing that is. Thank God for that. Not all of our siblings have been nice to us, but, you know, if you got them, thank God for them. Thank God for your family, your extended family, your aunts and uncles that you've had. Thank God you grew up in America. I mean, you could just go on and on and on. And you see, that helps you to love God more. You can do the same thing in marriage. Think how good your wife has been to you. And don't. And what does Peter say? And don't be bitter against your wife. And, and wives can think about, hey, like my mother, I've heard her say this over and over. I got a good man, she said, talking about my daddy. She said, a lot of women don't marry good men. I was lucky. I got a good man. And, uh, and I never knew them to have a fight in almost 50 years. They did before I was born, but after I was born, I guess I was a blessing. Hmm. <laughs> never knew them to have a fight after I, was, after I came home. So quality time with God is the same thing. Psalm 139, uh, this is what, I'm gonna read this to you. This is what I think David probably wrote this. But this is what we read here. Psalm 139, verse two. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. God must be around us. You understand my thought afar off. You compass my path wherever I'm walking. You're there with me. And my lying down, and, and you're acquainted with my way. So God is with us. There's not a word in my tongue but you, that you don't know it all together. So watch what you say. Verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit? There should be a capital S there, the Holy Spirit. 
Where shall I flee from your presence? Now, Jonah found out you couldn't get away from God from, by getting on a ship. If I ascend into heaven, and I've done that many times, the first heaven in an airplane, thou art there. It's always nice to know God's with you on that airplane. If I make my bed in Sheol, which means here a pit, like a cave in the earth, behold, you are there, you can't get away from God. In other words, God is with us, so spend quality time with God. Also, uh, in Genesis 18, 19, God said, I know Abraham, that he'll bring up his children right. I know Abraham. In Isaiah 41, verse 8, God calls Abraham his friend. Now, you can't be friends with somebody that you never spend time with, you never talk to, you haven't seen in six months. They're still your friend. I mean, I could say I've got friends from college that I haven't talked to in 20 years. I could call them friends, but, you know, just how great of friends are we when I haven't talked to them in 20 years? You see what I'm saying? And so a friend is somebody you spend some time with. Your spouse ought to be your best friend, but then you ought to spend time with God too. Jesus, on some occasions, prayed all night long. That's spending time with God. Also, he got up early in the morning. Mark 135 says he got up a great while before day and went out and prayed. He spent time with God. Well, here I want to read in John. If you're, I'm giving these references so that you can write them down if, if you care to. John 16, 32. Let me read that one to you. He says, the hour comes, yea, and now is come that you're going to be scattered every man to his own and you're going to leave me alone and yet listen to this i am not alone because the father is with me jesus knew that god was always with him so quality time would be the first way to, sh to love god with all your heart but that's not the only way let's take each one of these five love languages and apply them to god i've never given a sermon like this before number two words of affirmation you affirm god now husbands should affirm their wives and Proverbs 31, beginning in about verse 10, I'm not going to turn there, but it tells you how to affirm your wife. You ought, guys, you ought to read that. Don't just tell your wife to read that about the virtuous woman. See what, what the husband says about his wife. So we should affirm God in Psalm 145, verse 1. I will extol thee, my God, O king. I will bless your name forever and ever. <clears throat> the last part of verse 6. I will declare your greatness. Verse 21. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh Bless his holy name forever and ever. That was how he felt. Now, this is called David's psalm of praise. Do you see why David, David was a man after God's own heart? Psalm 146, verse 2. While I live, I'll praise the Lord. Is that you? Verse 9. The Lord preserves the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. What's he doing? He's affirming God. Look how wonderful God is. Look how great God is. You're affirming God. You're praising God. Praise, to praise God doesn't just mean to say, I hereby praise you. How do you praise your child? Right in front of the neighbors, you say, let me tell you, he made the honor roll, roll, and I'm so proud of my son. Well, my son can do this, he can do that. And when a kid hears his parents talk like that, they feel praised. If you're like me, you probably never heard that. But anyway, some, some kids actually hear that. <clears throat> it always kind of irritates me when I see these bumper stickers. My child is an honor roll student. Because my parents never had a bumper sticker like that in their car. Did he have a car? No. Had a car, but <laughs> he didn't have a bumper sticker that said that. I like the bumper sticker that says, my kid beat up your honor roll student. <laughs> that, that's more than me. So David was affirming God, as we see here. In uh, 147, verse 1. Praise the Lord. It's good to sing praises to our God. You say, but I can't sing. Well, make a joyful noise. It's pleasant and praise is comely. Therefore, we should do it. Uh, verse 3, listen. This is how you affirm God. He heals the broken in heart. He binds up their wounds. He tells the number of the stars. He calls them by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. You can tell God that in your prayer closet. God, you're great. I was trying to tell God one time how I how much I appreciate his greatness. And I don't know, I, was, I might have been a teenager at the time. And I said, God, you were just so, you're just, you're, you're neat. <laughs> I thought, you don't say that to God. <laughs> but God knew what was in my heart. You know, you don't tell God he's neat. But, you know, that's how, I was trying to, trying to compliment God. Now I know God got the message. Uh, <clears throat> verse 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp. If you don't have a harp, use your keyboard. If you don't have that, play a harmonica or something. Or just play a kazoo. Anybody can play one of those. Psalm 140, 
8, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise him from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise you, you his angels. Tell the angels to praise God. Praise him, all you hosts. Praise him, sun, moon, and stars. You getting this? Psalm, uh, that was 149, uh, 148. Psalm uh, 149, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Verse 2. Let Israel rejoice. Let them be joyful in their king. Verse 3. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises to it with a timbrel. That's like a tambourine and harp. Psalm 150. Here's how you affirm God. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. You get tired of hearing this? Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psalter in the heart. Praise him with the timbrel to dance. Praise him with stringed instruments. Some churches don't believe stringed instruments. You can praise him with your banjo, your guitar. Or a piano. Praise him with, with organs that were literally in Hebrew means horns. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Now do you understand that's affirming God. So number one is quality time with God. Talking to God. Spending time walking with God. Number two is praising God and affirming him. Number three receiving gifts. That's in this book, too. Some people, the way they know that you love them is when you just buy them gifts all the time and all the time and all the time and all the time. A person like that needs to marry a very rich person. Mm -hmm. They need to. Now, turn one page over to chapter 3 in Proverbs, verse 9. Here's how this is, if, if we're going to use that as our way of loving God also, not just one of these, but all five of them, honor the Lord with your substance. Honor him with the first fruits of all your increase. Now, don't tell me you do that and you don't tithe. People have all kinds of excuses. They're not going to tithe. Honor God with your substance and with your increase. The first part is the tithe. Yes, ma'am. What's that? Proverbs. Proverbs 3 and verse 9. Honor God with your substance and your increase. The first tenth. You're to honor God. Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but render to God that which is God's. And God claims the tenth is his. That's Leviticus 27, uh, verse 30, I think it is. Jesus also said in Matthew 25, when you do things to help people, when you do to the least of these and you help them, you've done it unto me. That's another way to render gifts to God is to help other people. When it comes to, to receiving gifts, we should tithe and give offerings to God because we should give to the gospel. People say, I give my tithe to the poor man down the street. Give that out of your own income over the tithe. But the tithe is supposed to go to preach the gospel. That's 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. The tithe is to preach the gospel. Why? To get people saved. The purpose for the church the Bible says the church has a commission. We call it the Great Commission. Go ye, the church, not just an apostle or a prophet, but all of you. Now, we personally can't do it ourselves, but we send missionaries uh, when we put our tithes into the gospel. And so if we all support the gospel, we are doing what Jesus said, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's Mark chapter 16, the Great Commission. And then in Matthew, if you read it in the Greek, it says, go in all the world and make disciples. So we're making converts for Christ. That is the Great Commission. I have been in 100 nations around the world preaching the gospel. But I didn't go there on a, on a boat or, a, or an airplane. I did it through radio and got letters from countries in different parts of the world. How did I go? People through their tithes sent me there. Chapter 10 of Romans, it says, how can they hear the gospel except they be sent? And when you pay your tithes, you are sending the gospel out. Make sure <clears throat> that you're sending out the true gospel and not a false gospel. Like this live stream goes out all over the world. Yeah, this live stream. We've had well over a thousand people in Pakistan to be watching, Poland, Kenya. Brazil, Kenya. Kenya. We have regular people that watch in Kenya. Regular people, every every yeah, welcome to all of our international audience, those of you in Kenya and different places. Um, and of course Canada and some, some uh, Brazil and South America, and I don't know where all. But your tithes and offerings make this possible so that we can get this message out to people and help them grow in grace and knowledge. By the way, I heard my own voice on radio this morning. I was going to tell you about that. Um, 
My program doesn't come on until 1230 today, but I just happened, I was going, I was pushing the buttons on my radio as I was getting ready to cross the railroad track just before we got to the railroad track coming here this morning. And, and I was, and I hit the station, and I heard my own voice. I thought, I'm not on radio at this hour. And it was that commercial they asked me to do. And, uh, but it was me talking, you know, that's interesting. They were advertising our 1230 broadcast. Be sure to try to listen to that. It's only a half hour. It's not an hour, it's just a half hour. And uh, it comes on at 12.30 a.m. 9.60. I hope you'll try to listen to it every Or truthnetwork.com. Or if you're at home, truthnetwork.com. And make sure you pick the Charlotte thing. It's all across America. You have to click on the Charlotte area. What's the question? I, Bill Lampton is asking, I always wonder if first fruits are different than the tithe for the same. Well, first fruits are different. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a, kind of a whole different issue. First fruits... Um, can be more than the tithe. They can be just simply the first that you get in addition to the tithe. But that, that gets a little more complicated what time I've got to get into it right now. I remember one time I was out of work for a while and I said, God, I'll give you the first fruits, the first paycheck that I get. I won't spend it, the whole thing. The whole I gave the whole thing to God. I said, the first paycheck, I'm giving it all. And uh, my mother said, you ought not give it all to the work of God. She said, you need to keep that. You don't know when you're going to get another paycheck. I said, no, I told God he gets the first fruits. In addition to that, then all after that, I paid the tithes. Now, if you give the whole thing to God, <laughs> you paid the tithe and the other 90% too. Okay, so receiving of gifts. Number four, acts of service. Now that's, remember I told you, that's how some people, they get married, they're looking for, that's their love language, acts of service. So get the vacuum cleaner out. <laughs> but acts of service to God, ministry, teaching, preaching, Matthew 5, 18 said, not only should you keep the commandments, you should be teaching men so. That's an act of, act of service. What's that reference? The reference is Matthew 5, 18. Teach men so. You ought to ask God, God, what can I do? What do you want me to do? I always was afraid God would say, I want you to be a missionary. I've heard some horrible stories about how they had to eat bugs just to survive. I've heard some horrible missionary stories. And I was like, God, please don't tell me to be a missionary. But what do you want me to do? I'll do anything you say, but please don't, don't send me as a missionary. But then they don't all have it that bad, too, and some of them do. And I've heard some horror stories when I was a kid, and that turned me off of any possibility of ever being a missionary. But, uh, but ask God, where do you want me? Do you want me teaching? Do you want me preached? preach? Do you want me just to... I knew a guy, he wasn't an ordained minister. He was a carpet salesman, and yet he won more people to the Lord than most preachers. People would come buy carpet, and before they left, they'd be on their knees accepting Christ as their Savior. He did more ministry more service for God selling carpet than a lot of people doing pulpits. I asked him one time, I said, why don't you just get ordained? He says, I don't need to be. <laughs> so acts of service. And again, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Acts of service is obeying God. Now, for people who are listening, and hopefully none of you uh, are deceived on this, but there are people that think, well, the Ten Commandments were abolished at the cross. Well, 60 years after the cross, John wrote the following words. Listen to what John said in 1 John. He said this. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. This is how we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, but keeps not his commandments, is a liar. How about that? But whoso keeps his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we're in him if we're obedient to him. So, again, acts of service serve God. First John chapter 4 and verse 10. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation, a favor for our sins. You know, I've noticed over the years that parents love their kids more than kids love their parents. One lady who wasn't even anywhere near a Christian, she said, I'd die for my kids. And she wasn't even a Christian. Yes, sir. Yeah, and like I said earlier, not all of our parents were, were good parents. They weren't all perfect parents or good parents. But thank God you had her because you wouldn't be here if you didn't. You wouldn't be in the world. And so that's why the fifth commandment, no matter what they are, we're to honor them. But most of the time, parents love their kids more than kids ever return that love. Uh, my, my mother basically adopted my brother's son uh, and took care of him when he wasn't going to be able to stay here and they were going to ship him off because he was had some behavioral problems and so 
my mother just took care of him just like she took care of me boy she was there for him well then when he when she got in the nursing home and needed people to come visit her he was too busy to go visit her a lot of people put their parents off in a nursing home somewhere and just forget about them never go visit them never go see them but parents tend to love their kids a whole lot more what did that baby do to be to be loved nothing he screams, he hollers, he wakes you up in the middle of the night, and he soils his diapers, but that mother loves that child with all her heart. Look at a mother of a newborn kid. She just loves that kid to pieces, no matter what he does, because it's her kid. Do you know God loves you a lot more than you love him? Why did Jesus tell us to love God with all of our heart? Because that's how God loves you already. He loves you with all of his heart. All he's asking is for you he wants you just to return that love. That's all. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. That's why I'm trying to help you today. I'm not going to just say, go love God and send you home. I'm trying to help you to learn how to love God. Spend quality time with him. Do acts of service. Affirm your love for him over and over. First John 5, let me read verse uh, 19 of, of chapter 4 here. Verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. Chapter 5 and verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. Oh, I love mankind, okay? Here's how we know if we do. When we love God and keep his commandments. That's how you know if you love your neighbor. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. There it is. Well, now, if the commandments were abolished 60 years before, how come somebody forgot to tell John? Because he wrote this 60 years, thereabouts, give, give or take a year, after the cross. One page over in 2 John 6. This is love that we walk after his commandments. So that's acts of service. The last one is physical touch. A lot of men have this maybe as their first uh, love language in marriage. Children, certainly, a lot of children have it. They want to be touched by their parents. They want to be, in fact, when you're married, you should never walk into the kitchen, husbands, unless you at least just walk by and touch your wife. Just touch her on the shoulder. Let, just acknowledge her presence. Although that may not be her love language, and she might say, don't touch me. <laughs> that's, and don't touch her. But, but a lot of times, that's, that's one of their top love languages. By the way, if you've never read this book, there's also, I don't know if it's in this book or it comes with it, but you can get a test, and every married couple should take the test to find out what their love language is. So all these years, you've been trying to explain to your wife that you love her, and you're not communicating it because you don't know what her love language is. A lot of churches offer that a lot of churches offer this in the seminar. It's a good thing to do. My home church where I used to go did. Yeah, it's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. How does physical touch apply to God, though? Because you can't, you can't touch him. Well, let me go back to one verse here in the Psalms. Psalm 143 and verse 6. <clears throat> I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsts after thee as a thirsty man. I'm stretching forth my hands to you. Now, if you do that at home to your wife, she'll come up and reciprocate you, hope, and hug you. you. When we pray, it talks about lifting up your hands. In fact, Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, let's see if I've written it down here. 1 Timothy 2.8, I would that men everywhere lift up holy hands to God. Lift up holy hands. That's one of the ways you, that's what you do physically with your body. If physical touch, maybe that's your top love language in marriage. Well, how is it, how, what do you do to God? Physically, you can't do much with God, but you can lift your hands. What about this? Philippians 2.10. Every knee shall bow. God wants you to do something physically. Lift your hands. Bow your knees. You say, well, I bow my heart every day. That's good. But, but, you know, it wouldn't hurt once a day, at least one time a day, to kneel before the God of the universe and just worship him. Now, what I'm telling you is going to help you to learn how to obey the first and greatest commandment, which is to love God with all your heart. Yes, sir? How can you kneel? Yeah, if, you, if your health won't allow you to kneel, God knows that. I remember one time I was in the hospital, and I was hooked up to a bunch of stuff, and I couldn't get out of bed and get on my knees. But I was able to roll over. So I rolled over <laughs> on my stomach. And I said, well, I'm on my knees now on the bed. Uh, I can't even get down. Yep. Get, get on my knees. Well, you can pray in bed that way. Roll over on your, on your knees. And just say, God, this is the best I can do. And he knows that. 
when Jesus was on the cross and when the thief was on the cross, neither one of them got on their knees and prayed. But they still got results. Position of submission. Yeah, it's a position of submission. In fact, when somebody robs you, you do like this, that says, I surrender. Mm -hmm. when, when a dog finally gives up, he, he rolls over on his back with his feet up in there, I surrender. And you'll see a little dog do that sometimes to a big dog. Oh, that big dog's going to bite me. So he lays down, puts his, lays on his back. And he surrenders. And that's what we're doing. Lord, I surrender. I surrender all. That's what it means to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Micah 6, 8. I'm going to read just two more scriptures, and then we'll, we'll conclude for today. Micah 6 and verse 8 says, what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Last week, I remember reading to you Psalm 91. Because Psalm 91 is something we're going to have to pray when the tribulation begins. A lot of churches are not preparing their people for this period of time. Oh, don't worry about it. We won't be here anyway. But if you are here... You may not be here. You may have died. But if you are here, you need to really know Psalm 91. Verse 14 says, be, now this is God speaking to you. Now I'm going to conclude with this, so pay attention to this. Because he has set his love upon me. Now when you try to apply these five love languages to God, what are you doing? You're setting your love on God the best you can. You're a human being. You're not going to do it perfectly probably, but God sees you trying. God says this to you, every one of you in this room. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Boy, I've got a promise from Almighty God that when the great tribulation comes, I'm going to fly right through it. God's going to deliver me. Is he going to deliver you? Well, Maybe. Have you set your love on him? Do you love God with all your heart and all your mind and everything that's in you? See, that's the question that you have to ask yourselves. Not, don't tell me it's none of my business. You have to ask yourself that question. Do you really, really, really love God? God makes you a promise. You set your love upon him. I will deliver you. I will set him on high because he's known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. What are you going to say? Lord, deliver me from the tribulation. I'll answer you. Listen to this. I will be with him in trouble. Now, there's troubles coming, but he's going to be with us. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. When the great tribulation comes, you not only will be delivered, you may be honored during that terrible time. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Boy, that's a wonderful promise. Why? Because verse 14 says, because he set his love on me. If we truly love God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength and everything that's in us, then he's going to deliver you. One time, oh, I was 18 years old, and I built me a prayer altar out in the woods. I didn't have privacy in my house, so I just built me an altar out there in which Jesus went out in the wilderness and prayed, so I built me one out in the wilderness, out in the woods. And... I went out there one time and I said, I just want to tell God how much you love him. And the way I, I, you know, you can't just say I love you. Think about what they mean to you when you tell somebody that, that you love them. And I was thinking of all the things that God had done for me. And I was thinking how much I really did love God. And so I, I decided I would tell him that. And I raised my hands and I said, Lord, I just want to tell you. And I got this lump in my throat. And I'm a German. We don't show emotion, but I could feel my face blushing. I was so embarrassed. Nobody was there but me. And I, you know, the hot tears were coming down, down my cheeks, and I was trying to tell God how much I loved him, and the words didn't come out. The lump was in my throat, and it was painful. I mean, it hurt. That lump, I don't know where those lumps come from, but I couldn't even speak, and I felt stupid. And yet, in my heart, I knew that God heard what I was saying. I couldn't get the words out, but it came from my heart. When God sees that you, from your heart, you love him, and you really, really love God, 
when this tribulation comes, he will deliver you. Did you get anything out of this today? Amen. Amen. Take it to heart. Start practicing it today. It's your homework assignment. All right. Let's see if we have any. any Ten-second delay. We have any other questions? Okay. Okay. I want to thank all of you for coming out. Hey, come back every week because we're getting close to the holy days here. So two weeks from today will be a Feast of Trumpets. And we'll send you out an email on Friday night to let you know for sure the new moon has been seen in Israel. And if it is, if they don't see it, it'll be the next day, which will still be a Sunday, so you won't have to take off from work. If so. anybody's interested, um, Kirk's link, he's updated his website with the holy days through 2030. Through your 2030, so you Biblical go there. Calendar.org. Yeah. Cool yes, quick question. If Jesus comes back, will he come back in September? There's <clears throat> a very good chance he was born in September. There's a very good chance his second coming will be in September. And uh, he was born, we know, around the Feast of Trumpets. Some people think tabernacles. No, when you study it out, in the year he was born, it was around the, the, the Feast of Trumpets. So there's a very good chance he could even come back on the Feast of Trumpets. But since I don't know what day of the week that is, right. I can't tell you. All right, you're all dismissed. Thank you all for coming. Hope to see every one of you back next week. Have, have some time of fellowship and be dismissed.